Hi and hello, none of you on High Def have missed anything. We're talking about the what if of Trump and Rand, but you haven't missed anything. Thanks for hitting Fukushima, you're caught up. Um, it's bigger than that. Rand and Trump seem to genuinely not like each other. Whatever it is that happened during their little golf outing or their whatever outing, between the time that they golfed and Trump donated to the eye charity that Rand started, somewhere between the two, there's Buffalo run through the room, the something fell apart. They don't like each other. They're not getting along. However, let's Let's play pretend here, and it's all because of the story next that I say that. Let's play pretend here for a second. What if Rand took his father's idea one step further? What do I mean? Let's play pretend, shall we? What if Rand Paul took his father's idea. His father said, why don't we become Republicans, on paper at least, and bring the libertarianism ideal. Bring the libertarianism ideal into the party. Infiltrate the party, so to speak. Okay, they did that. What if Rand Paul were to take it one step further? What if Rand Paul was to say, I will infiltrate the White House with libertarianism. The same way my father interjected libertarianism into the Republican Party. What if Rand Paul looks at his poll numbers, which are abysmal, and looks at Rand's, or at Trump's, which are great, and says, hey, libertarians, Trump, we, we don't see eye to eye on everything. However, this is a chance to do what it is that they've been saying that they're going to do, right? They're going to, they're going to change from within. How many of you would pull the lever for Trump Rand? I don't, I don't, I, we want it to be Paul Trump. I get it. I get it. You'd vote for that, wouldn't you? Well, again, let's, let's, let's play pretend. Max Slavo, shtfplan.com, Rand Paul backs Trump, unleashes the top ten things that make Obama unqualified for office. Now what he's referring to is the White House claimed that Trump was disqualified from running for office because of what he said about allowing Muslims into the country. He wants to put a hold on it until they can be properly vetted, is what he said. Um, Senator Rand Paul has said, okay, fine. Trump has suggested something that is against the Constitution. Okay, here are ten things that Obama has done that is against the Constitution. That would mean that Trump is 90% more qualified to be president than Obama. One, he tried to take over one-sixth of the economy in Obamacare and wreck the system and hurt patients and taxpayers. That is true. I had remarkable insurance that I could afford before Obamacare, and now I have terrible insurance that I can barely afford after. Um, two, he thinks an executive order is legislation and how to make law. It's not. Three, he fought an undeclared, unconstitutional war in Libya and turned it into a jihadist wonderland. What's he talking about? Gaddafi was not a wonderful man. I promise you, Gaddafi was definitely not a wonderful man. However, Gaddafi was very good at keeping warring factions of Islam away from each other, or at least tolerant of each other. And he was also very, very, very good at getting the Muslims to leave the Christians alone get to Christians, you know, everybody, relative peace. After what we did there, we created a hellstorm that led to ISIS rising. That's what he's talking about. Um, five, assigned into law the indefinite detention of American citizens. Uh, Paul's referring to the NDAA, which was signed by Obama in 2011. 
and it earned heavy criticism from groups like the ACLU. Six, his copy of the Bill of Rights obviously goes from one to three, he's skipping the Second Amendment, and we're going to talk all about how guns have saved lives recently. You heard about Paris? Let's talk about the Paris that should have happened, but didn't, because somebody was armed. We're going to get to it. Um, seven. The federal appeals court ruled his NSA spying on every American is illegal. Trump broke the Constitution. He wants to break the Constitution. Let's look at this. Eight. He has added more debt than anyone in history. That's, that's not being facetious or being allegorical. It, it's mathematical fact, by the way. Appoint an attorney general who thinks free speech against Muslims is a bigger threat than terrorism. 10. The EPA rules by executive fiat trying to kill an entire industry in the way of life. That would be coal. What the Obama administration wants to do is they're using the lie, and yes it is a lie, of global warming. Man is not warming the planet and has never warmed the planet and will never warm the planet unless, of course, Putin nukes us. Um, they're trying to shut down the coal industry so that they can tax you more for other other forms of energy creation that are extremely expensive. And to sell this to you, they're going to tell you that they're warming, we're warming the planet if we don't do it. None of that is true. And you don't have to take my word for it. Look up Climate Gate. Look up Lord Christopher Monckton. Look up the plethora of scientists, scientists who are pointing out the lie of global warming. So Rand Paul right there mentions 10 in a row and uh, I was very, very happy to see that. I also, if I could, wanted to get to ever so quickly here, is uh, more with Rand. Rand has absolutely been on fire lately. And again, he's been taking a lot less arrows from Donald Trump as of late. So the goal is, I think, with most, most of us to hope that something comes of this. Because you got to remember, Rand started this out in the lead and then lost it uh, for reasons that I've covered in other shows. Little by little, we're seeing the people that loved Rand are in fact still there. They simply have moved to Trump because he delivered his message better than Rand delivered the one that he had, which was probably a better message. But if those two could have a meeting of the minds at, at some point and in some way, then uh, this could be a very good day indeed. And that's what we're hoping for here. That's what we're absolutely praying for here. Um, let's check this out real quick. Christianity in the Middle East is on the verge of extinction. Now, you want to talk about, there's always people, there's always people out there talking about how Islamists or America or whatever stole the land that is Israel. And all Jews are terrible. Do you realize that the Christians that we are about to talk about have been in this land before Mohammed married his nine year old bride? Okay? Before he was born. These Christians were in this land. Therefore, if you're one of these people that are so adamant about how terrible it is that Israel exists, where is your outrage here? Because the Christians were in this land long, long before there was any disaster called Islam. And I, I don't think that all Islamists are bad people. But I think that the worst of the worst do climb to the leadership in the religion, and I don't know why that is. But it happens in our culture, too. Obama and Bush, Clinton, come on now. The worst of the worst have risen to the top in democracy, and the worst of the worst have risen to the top in Islam, clearly. Daily Caller, 1,300,000 Iraqi Christians have been displaced, murdered, or taken prisoner since 03. A centuries-old civilization now faces permanent extinction. And this is happening while the rest, rest of the world, including the U.S. government, looks on. 
As Christians across the world begin to celebrate Christmas, it says, the 300,000 remaining Christians displaced in Iraq and Syria are preparing for a harsh winter that will most certainly dwindle their numbers even further. It says Islamic State has been assaulting Christianity in the Middle East for over a year and a half, and now the few remaining will be forced to brave the elements in the face of genocide. It says the Syrian culture is melting, says Juliana Tayyamarovi, head of the Iraqi Christian Relief Council, a group dedicated to aiding Christians being persecuted in the Middle East, in an interview with the Daily Caller News Foundation. Tia Morazi is making a desperate push to try and raise money to save Assyrian Christians in Iraq before winter sets in. We want to buy caravans, says Tia Morazi, referring to a camper-style vehicles that can serve as temporary shelters equipped with running water and electricity. Isn't it amazing that Obama has accepted almost no Christians, under 10? Under 10 of the known refugees brought to this country have been Christian. Even though they're 10% of the country of which they're supposed to be fleeing from, we've got like under 10. We let Islamists in in droves, and you're considered a racist if you wish to vet them. Meanwhile, the Christians, which harm absolutely nobody, are left to die. Isn't it also funny that we have tons of money to equip Turkey? which, of course, is doing nothing but supplying ISIS with weapons, either on accident or on purpose, or in my opinion, both. Um, but we don't have any money to give caravans to the original Christians. But it wouldn't be fair. The Iraqi Christian minority, also known as Assyrian Christians, has a history in Nineveh Plains region of Iraq, going back... 6,700 years, that is before Christianity, the people that became Christians are in, were in that land, as a matter of fact. Assyrians were one of the first major groups in the region to convert to Christianity and are one of the last groups to speak Aramaic, which, of course, the language of Jesus Christ. What does that sound like? Look up Passion of the Christ. That is the language that the movie is done in. It says that prior to the invasion of Iraq in 03, Assyrians outnumbered 1.6 million in Iraq. They numbered, excuse me. While the rise of al-Qaeda in Iraq and the Iraqi insurgency, their numbers began to dwindle. In 2014, there were less than 500,000 from 1.6 million. In just over a year since its rise, ISIS has slaughtered and displaced the Assyrian Christians with brutal efficiency cutting their numbers nearly in half to 300,000. Now let me ask you something. I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about the atrocities of Hitler. We should. I'm not saying we shouldn't talk about the number of people that Stalin killed, most of which were Christians. Stalin killed more Christians than Hitler did Jews, by the way. How is it that we are missing one of the major genocides of our time that are supposed to be our own brothers and sisters. ISIS took in 280, ISIS, excuse me, took 280 Assyrian hostages to Syria, says Tia Morazi. Three of the hostages were executed on video in October by the scum of ISIL. This represented the first time ISIS executed Christians on camera, yet Tia Morazi claims the incident went essentially ignored by the Western media. Of course, we were too busy talking about safe zones. ISIS is demanding $100,000 in ransom for each Christian. That's $28 million to stave off extinction of one of the last remaining Christian groups in the entire Middle East. Many Assyrians in the uh, dysphoria have been successfully resettled in Europe and the U.S., including Tamarazi herself, who fled her native Iran in 89. So, I mean, what's interesting here is we have the incredible die-off of Christianity, kill-off, as a matter of fact. And not a word is said. Not a word is said. You've got Donald Trump that wants to prevent Muslims from coming into the country, and whether you like the idea or not, Democrats, can I talk to you for a minute? Do I have your attention? During the Iran issue in the early 80s, late 70s, Jimmy Carter, he would be a Democrat. He was a president. 
for those, I'm, I'm talking to Democrats, so I'm assuming you don't know. He was a Democratic president before Ronald Reagan. He stopped Iranians from coming into the country temporarily until the problem was solved. So don't give me this BS that Donald Trump is a racist for doing this during a time of tragedy. It's against the Constitution, and I think there's better ways to do it. I'll, I'll address that another time if you wish. Leave me a comment, I'll do it. Um, people were left... Do you know the people that came to Ellis Island when they settled in this country? Interesting, true story. Do you realize that they were on Ellis Island for between 30 to 90 days while they were vetted? They didn't come here to Ellis Island, and then two days later they were in New York. No, it's not the way it worked. So don't tell me that there's no precedent for this, because there is. And don't tell me it's a Republican issue, because it is not, as I just proved to you. Friends, you're listening to The Correct View. Sam, I beat again. you got a few more stories to get to. Christelle and your crazy sound effects, if you want to do them, bring them up. But hurry, hurry, hurry. Um, I want to let you know, you can go to Sticker Junkie. Look right there, Sticker Junkie. Dot com. You know, any design that you have on stickers, D-Lake is going to give you the most amazing looking stickers you've ever seen. And I've got even better news for you. If you type in correct views or the correct views as a promo code when you check out with your stickers, you're going to get a special savings just because you mentioned the correct views. Just because you're listening, just because you hit subscribe, just because you hit share. They support us. Also, if you want, look up a change transportation. If you're within, I would say, I don't know, 50 or 100 miles of Canton, Ohio, and uh, let them know you heard about change transportation. It's like a cab company, only better. Let them know you heard about it from the correct views, and you're going to get a savings from them as well. Gateway Pundit Jim Hoft. Concealed permit holder saves Chicago crowd from a mass shooter. Now, let me tell you how responsible gun owners get hosed for being peaceful. And I'm glad they are. That's not my point. Let me tell you how they get hosed for being peaceful. Where is Christelle with her gunshot samples? Nowhere to be found. Um, the issue here is if a crazy gunman starts shooting up, uh, fill in the blank, if the higher his body count gets, the more news coverage he gets, and the more they want to shut down our right to have guns and protect ourselves. However, when an armed citizen responsibly kills someone who is trying to start a mass shooting, and the body count is, what, what one? The mass shooter's dead. When that happens, there's no great story. Somebody got shot. You don't really hear the story. You don't hear that hundreds of lives were possibly saved because of the actions of a responsible gun owner. You only hear about it when there isn't a responsible gun owner to stop the tragedy. Don't believe me? You don't have to believe me. Why don't you try Jim Hoff to Gateway Pundit? See if you believe him. <coughs> A concealed permit holder and Uber driver saved a crowd in Chicago when he opened up fire on a gunman who had opened a fire in Logan Square. This is from Breitbart, another source. On Friday, as you can see on Fact Cam, an Uber driver, and they have done this before, and I used to be a cab driver, and I support it 110% of the way. An Uber driver with a concealed carry permit thwarted an attempted mass shooting by pulling his own weapon and shooting the gunman who had opened fire in Chicago's Logan Square. Illinois Assistant State's Attorney Barry Quinn verified that the driver had a concealed carry permit and acted in the defense of himself and others. Christelle, we need your sound effects. According to the Chicago Tribune, a driver was watching a group of people walk in front of his car on North Milwaukee Avenue just before midnight when 22-year-old Alvarado Custodio allegedly began firing into the crowd. It says the Uber driver pulled his own gun and fixed six shots at 
custodial, wounding him in the shin, the thigh, and the lower back. Well, the dinosaurs could have taken that much shots. Good Lord. Uh, the attempted mass shooting ended with no one at all but Castudio injured. Well, you didn't hear about that, did you? I told you to hit subscribe. The Chicago Sun-Times, a fourth source for those of you that would doubt me, reported that the Uber driver had dropped off a passenger minutes before Castudio allegedly began shooting. The Times contacted Uber about the incident, and they simply said, quote, the company requires all of its drivers to abide by local, state, and federal laws pertaining to transporting firearms in vehicles. God bless them. And if you, if you want to know why I'm saying it, go ahead and spend, spend a few years. I was almost a decade, unfortunately. Go ahead and spend some time as a cab driver, and you will quickly find out that the Second Amendment is not just there, for hunting. No matter how many, no matter how much you like deer meat. Uh, Chris, now I need gunshots. You've got to hurry. Snowden, Michael Phelan, Prison Planet reports. Snowden, armed citizen in Garland, did what surveillance state couldn't. Listen to this. NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden took to social media Wednesday to note that one armed citizen in Garland, Texas, was able to accomplish what the surveillance state has it, preventing a terrorist attack. Speaking to, the, speaking to the FBI's latest attempt to undermine encryption protocols, that is the right to have your messages known between nobody other than you and the person you sent it to, Snowden stated that the $53 billion surveillance budget was not what stopped the terror attack. After two ISIS sympathizers, at least one of which was known to the FBI, there's a link right there, they already knew about this person before they did it, before he opened fire at last May's Draw Mohammed cartoon contest, one armed individual providing security for the event was able to take down both attackers. Oh, guns are bad! Mentioning that other such incidents, Snowden also pointed out that even unarmed citizens have stopped terror attacks as well. And despite claims that increased widespread surveillance is needed to thwart future attacks, the federal government thus far has failed to provide one instance in which mass surveillance has prevented any attack at all. Snowden made similar comments during an interview with NBC last year in which he stated that mass surveillance failed to stop the 911 terror attacks and the Boston Marathon bombing, despite intelligence agencies having pertinent information beforehand. They knew who they were before. It wasn't that things were encrypted and they couldn't find it. They still couldn't stop it, or didn't stop it. It said the divided panel also concluded that the program raises serious threats to civil liberties and has shown limited value in stopping terrorism. We have not identified a single instance where it's happened. It says if you're missing things like the Boston Marathon bombings, where all of these mass surveillance systems, every domestic dragnet in the world, didn't reveal that the Russian intelligence service told us already uh, by name, is that really the best way to protect our country? Or are we trying to throw money at a magic solution that's actually just not just costing us our safety? but our rights and our way of life, Snowden said. His statements were subsequently edited out of the NBC interview prior to airing. Yeah, because they don't want him to actually speak the truth, because the truth makes sense. And if people hear the truth, they might actually listen to it. Christelle, if you're going to make it with those sound effects, you better hurry. Because we are on to the dumb. today. I don't think we're going to get sound effects. EAG News, normally on here for Fukushima, by the way, banned elementary school deems tag too dangerous for the playground. Yes, Victor Skinner tells us in this article, mustn't play tag. It's too rough. 
It's in Toronto, Canada. Otherwise, I might have made it the Dunce Cap of the Month award winner, but so far we aren't sending them out of the country. Uh, we did send a runner-up, though. Uh, the classic playground game tag is too dangerous. Before all this came to save us from these dangerous things, the game of tag they were playing was getting overly physical and rough. Toronto Catholic School District Board spokesman John Yon said, students pushed, punched, and tackled each other. They were not watching, they were blindly running over other kids, Yan said. So instead of correcting them, it's easier to ban the game of tag. I wish I had sound effects. It's madness. On Tuesday, St. Luke students were allowed to start playing ball tag using a soft ball. And they've always been permitted to play soccer. Well, they won't be for long. We're listening to Rush Limbaugh talk about uh, concussion soccer. You're, you look it up. Rush Limbaugh concussion soccer. It says, but at grade 7 and 8, students must use a soft rubber ball to lessen injuries should someone get hit, according to the star. 7th and 8th graders? The school is also partnering with the Toronto Public Health Department's physical activity leaders in schools, it's called the PALS program, to train teachers about playground safety strategies that would be passed on to older students tasked with policing the playground to make sure you have no fun. You must not kick super fun ball. You must not throw super fun ball. You must not hold super fun ball. PALS Health Promotion Specialist Mary Louise Yarima told the Star Public Health officials could work with St. Luke to adapt tag to the school's small 0.7 acre playground so that you're not going to do it in a running pace, but a walking. Meanwhile, uh, Common Core is making it so they can't add, subtract, mod multiply, or divide. So, I mean, we, they, they can't even play tag now. School board trustee Joanne Davis claimed in an email that the, to the star that nothing is banned at the school. It is just the principal is doing the very responsible thing.